Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us in World MS Day for the book launch of Head Above Water, Reflections on Illness by Dr. Shahad al Shamari. It's really great to see so many of you joining here and we hope it will be a stimulating evening. Firstly, both of you, welcome, a very warm welcome today. It's an exciting day and we're really happy to have you both here. Um, so first I'll just introduce the two of them. Dr. Shahad al Shamri is an author and academic and lives with multiple sclerosis. She holds a PhD from the University of Kent Canterbury. She returned to Kuwait to teach literature and pioneer disability narratives and voices. Her work centers on disability, women's studies, and Arab women's narratives. Yasmin al Askari is a past student of Shahad's. She graduated from the Gulf University of Science and Technology in 2019 with a degree in English literature. She is currently a high school English teacher working in Kuwait and she plans to complete her MA in English education this upcoming fall semester at UCL in London. Um, so I'm going to turn to Shahad now. Uh, Shahad, can you tell us a little bit about the book first? And then I believe you and Yasmin are going to read an extract from the book. Yes, yeah, thank you, Archna. Um, thank you everyone for actually joining our session. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here today. Uh, first of all, a big thank you goes to Neem Tree Press for organizing a virtual launch. Um, I'm currently in Kuwait and Neem Tree Press is based in the UK, so they've done everything to make sure we have a lot of people actually um, uh, able to join us and access our, our talk today. Uh, I'm wearing orange, as you can all see, because orange is the color of uh, multiple sclerosis awareness. I think a lot of us know that pink is for breast cancer, uh, blue is for autism, but orange is for MS. So here's to uh, World MS Day. Um, I also want to thank everyone who's uh, a student or a friend or a book reviewer who's actually here to meet the author and meet also Yasmin, who's a big part of the book. So thank you for uh, joining us. Head Above Water is the first um, book from the Gulf region that actually deals with illness and disability, and it centers experiences of, um, of academia, of bodies, of um, lots of different issues that actually I'd never seen anywhere. And so that's why I ended up writing the book. And I'm really happy that it found a home and even happier that it's now finding readers who are able to connect to the book. Um, Yasmin and I would like to read something for you, um, so we will start with that. So this is the cover of Head Above Water. I hope you all managed to get a copy, if you can see it. Uh, Yasmin, are you ready? Yes, ready. Perfect. All I want is to wake up. I want to stay awake for this part of the story. If I managed to write, then I stayed awake. How to call upon my internal narrator to tell the story of a body, of a self that is trapped inside, yet completely convinced that there is no way out. I'm aware that time will have its say. I have perpetually sleepy eyes and my eye muscles are closing in on me, bringing me closer to myself. I have to close them. I have to look inside. What follows will be what comes through. I've been thinking that you should write another book. Maybe I could help you. I can't seem to find a character. I can't seem to find the time or the clarity. I'm forgetting almost everything that I ever saw, felt, and touched. I'm preoccupied with this body. I tell her this and look away, hoping that she won't ask for more. But I had always pressed her for more. Elaborate. Don't leave your reader hanging. There has to be a point to what you're trying to say, even if the point is elusive. Find your way, take the reader along. You're a literary critic, but criticism had failed. And I was looking at life as random, meaningless. I couldn't tell her that because I believed I knew better. Even in meaningless, there is meaning, a sense of a beginning and an ending. And there was a beginning at some point of my life, my disease, my first teaching days. That's where we had met after all. Life was a classroom and a handful of eager students. Professor, everything here is expired. I don't think you've opened your fridge in forever. She has been here so many times over the past few years that I lost count. When had this friendship formed? 
perhaps it was at the very beginning of her graduate days, we used to sit together in my office discussing books, protagonists, and to an extent, the seductiveness of antagonists. I watched as she acquired critical vocabulary and a voice that wasn't as breathless when she spoke. Wasn't it Helen Sisu who had once urged us to watch when a woman speaks with her entire body, gasping for the words? She had been right. In every classroom, the smarter ones choked. Sometimes I did too, but I had gotten better at hiding it. Age is an armor to wear when confronted with any demons. Lucky, my dog, and Yasmin looked at each other. The beauty of friendship between two generations, two species, two worlds apart. Yasmin is a younger version of me, and as so many of my colleagues had noticed, a stronger and gentler one, comfortable in her body, in her skin. In a society that demanded children from women before the age of 30, she had made her choices. Throughout every conversation we had shared, both of us had learned a bit more about vulnerability, love, pain, and life. These bits of conversation started again when Yasmin asked me to write. I found the notes you wrote to me when I graduated. Do you remember? You used to give your students notes to remind them of who they were. Mine said, be brave, be willing to lose people for a dream. And it was so simple, but I remember the line. I do too. So what do you have to lose now if you were to write a second book? I've already lost parts of my body and the people I'm writing about are ghosts. Some never existed. I want to create another me. Could she, he be a professor too? It's a big part of who you are. Characters are more than just their jobs. They're more than just their names. What makes a soul any different from another's? What, what is in a name? I had spent a number of years learning my students' names, 182 per semester. I thought of it as a game. I would say each name silently, then under my breath, and finally out loud. I would smile, hoping to soften the blow if it was the wrong name. Practicing their names helped me exercise my memory. At the time, I still believed you could control the outcome. The progression could slow down. Like an hourglass, my body twisted and turned into itself to escape time. But then I turned to stories and to my novels, to Arab and women writers, to memoir and to fiction, to disability and to gender. What story to write when there was so much to tell and so very little space to capture it in? Space, the psychic space, not the pages, not their feel against my hands, which I think I remember were dry. Today, sensation is not part of life and the physical texture of objects is no longer tangible. It is only in the distant memory of what they once felt like. Objects carry their descriptive and prescriptive qualities, filed somewhere between the neurons and the scar tissue in my brain. Paper has a distinct feeling to it, just like all the stories of the women who'd crossed over. They crossed into territory that you dreamed up, made up, and sometimes came so close to. This was the other world, the place you visited once and from where I had never been able to return. This was a place I had died in and what I thought I heard and saw, what I tasted. Give yourself some time. You always used to say, take your time. You owe the world nothing more than to take your time. I'm here for a month, and meanwhile, I'll arrange these books and all of these notebooks. I'll come once a week. And I think we'll stop here just to keep you hanging. This is how Head Above Water starts. That was fabulous, both of you. Um, you know, I've read the book so many times, but in that, in that, um, in this telling of it, 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 it really emphasizes how beautiful a book it is, and I think it showcases the closeness of your relationships and that structure has worked I think really effectively and as you know Shahad I've told you in the past I read the book in one sitting um, and it really is a, a fabulous book and um, so uh, now on to questions um, so I wanted to talk to you about um, you've talked a little bit about what drove you to write the book the fact that there wasn't um, that you were highlighting certain narratives that had not been highlighted in the publishing world um, so I wanted to perhaps if you can expound a little bit on that, but also talk about the publishing journey. You know, how long did it take you to put together 
Um, how difficult was it? How many people did you approach? How did you find us? Um, that would be great. So I think it all really started um, with uh, moving from different genres. So I started off as a poet and I was actually blogging about my experiences. Um, I then wrote a collection of short stories, which also was very, very difficult uh, to publish, being, you know, an Arab writer, a Kuwaiti writer, uh, somebody who's actually, um, you know, pretty much disconnected from um, the, the other side of the world, but using English as my first language, uh, the, the language that I write in. So a lot of publishers found that um, to be um, not very marketable not something you could really market and work with. I wrote Head Above Water over a course of a few years, and uh, it was a collection of um, diary entries, conversations with uh, Yasmin herself and, and other really significant uh, others. And um, during the pandemic, I really, really started looking into whether this would be something that could actually uh, be interesting to others too. So not just keeping it in my in my blog or on uh, diary entries. And you know, with the help of um, Yasmin convincing me to write um, and other um, you know, significant others, um, I started looking for publishers. And I started with the US, and then I moved on to the UK, and then I moved on to the to the rest of the world. I tried places like Egypt, uh, places like Germany, places like Switzerland, everything you could possibly think of. And so I, you know, devised a really, you know, nice looking proposal and a query letter. And I got lots of people to look at it, lots of colleagues of literature, lots of scholars, lots of writers. And it seemed that I had something to say. But um, I would get rejection after rejection after rejection after months of waiting, silence, no response at all. And the usual response was, thank you. While we think this is an interesting narrative, we think it's too specific to your experience. Um, other, other comments were uh, something like, while we think this is really moving, we just cannot relate to it. So it really made me pause and wonder uh, what is there to relate to when I think we can all relate to illness in general? You don't have to relate to breast cancer or multiple sclerosis or autism, but you know, we all grow old and age with age, illness comes as part of age. You're not gonna have the same body. And I think I've said this before, you might wake up one day and suddenly you're disabled or you're ill. Uh, you go for a checkup and you have cancer. So I think illness is one of these universal experiences but a lot of publishers paused and, and wondered if this would be something that would interest able-bodied readers or readers from the experiences. And those experiences were not about the body. If they were, then they were sexual. They were experiences that would, you know, kind of uh, discuss what's it like living under Islamic measures, patriarchal societies, but definitely not the kind of um, narrative that I was aiming to, to, to publish. In comes Arkna Sharma, uh, Neem Tree Press. So I found Neem Tree Press uh, through social media. I follow a lot of um, independent publishers who have a similar vision to, to what I think my vision is, which is you know, um, amplifying voices that are um, not living in the UK or in the US, but these voices have something to say. And so Neem Tree Press picked up the, the book and I was incredibly blessed and I feel also it was a twist of fate uh, because Archana just picked it up and read it and uh, really, really decided to, I think you decided to go against the, the, the norms you know, of, of publishing. And with her inspiring team, and it's, a, it's like a feminist team, a team that believes in amplifying uh, women's voices and uh, men's voices too, of course, but any marginalized voice. And I think because you picked it up, that's where the book actually managed to turn out the way it did. Um, having that similar vision, uh, we edited the book together. Um, and I think you were open enough to work with me um, despite geographical distances. Um, not the easiest to market an author who lives abroad. 
and you know yet you know having that i think that integrity and and uh, you know that ethics of publishing because i think publishing does have to have an ethics so what is publishable is is what counts but also what is your role as someone who has a publishing house someone who has the connections you've got that privilege and so i think working with neem tree press um really really did, did do a lot for the book. And then um, I, I'll also have to mention, of course, the rest of the team, they marketed the book by placing the book in the right hands, the book reviewers, um, the bookstagrammers who are most of them, I can see a lot of their names are here. So I think without that kind of connection, the book would have never seen the light. And I think um, persevering for me, um, not really, you know, I did almost give up at some point, but, you know, continuing to pitch and try and read about different uh, publishers, I think that's what got me to Neem Tree Press and definitely a twist of fate, I think. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, it was a twist of fate um, <laughs> and uh, a, a very fortuitous one. So I um, just, you know, we've had these conversations about which voices are universal, which voices are considered platformable and which are not. And I have to say, you know, was it my medical background? I don't think so. I think I read that book and it all spoke to me. I read your book and every part of it spoke to me. It spoke to me as a woman, as someone who can suddenly wake up and find that their life has changed dramatically because of you know one singular event that you are not in control of. Um, you talk about circles of friendship. We have, you know, each of us experience very strong women in our lives. And so, and we've all, you know, many of us have experienced cultures other than the ones that we were born in. And I think there's a commonality of cultures. Of course, each culture has its own uh, disparateness. So for me, it really is a truly universal book and it's just beautiful. And if you like literature, you speak a lot about that. Um, and I think obviously that's, that's, your, um, that's your academic uh, background. Um, so uh, yes, so just, yes, I, th I think it's a, it's a fabulous book. Um, so specific questions, um, what's significance in the title? So why Head Above Water uh, Reflections on Illness? Well, I think with Head Above Water um, as a title, I usually don't want to give away where it is in the book. So please do read the book, you'll find out why. But uh, I usually tell my students and myself, and my mother always tells me, you know, keep your head above water. So I think um, that's part of it. Um, also, Head Above Water kind of gives you this uh, kind of this illusion or this idea that you're not necessarily swimming, but your head is still above water. You haven't necessarily reached the shore you're still going no matter what. And I think that's constantly the state I find myself in. And that's the advice I tend to give, you know, people who ask for advice. So, you know, people actually ask me, how do you do what you do? Or, you know, how do I go through this? I just kind of say, chin up, head above water. But there's a lot more to it. And I hope you read the book to, to find out. Brilliant. And um, so what are the key similarities and differences between this book and your previous books? Well, I think that uh, like every individual and like every author, I find that I've really, really kind of grown um, and um, started to explore different genres. I started with poetry. And that was actually a self-published book. And then I moved into fiction and uh, short stories, which is uh, Notes on the Flesh. And then I finally dared to write nonfiction, uh, narrative nonfiction. And I think that took me a lot of uh, reflection and sort of a, 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 a an actual um, goal to to say it for what it was rather than using metaphor rather than I would say hiding behind fiction or poetry uh, narrative nonfiction or, or this um, head above water was a huge jump for me and a huge change in, in, in what I decide to put out there what I decide to write uh, knowing that there are weren't many memoirs out there from Arab women or um, non-Western voices, let's say, in general, that dealt with the body. I felt that that was a huge shift and a, a, a huge move that I, that I would have to do. So I don't think I was ready for that a uh, bit younger. And I think that's kind of how the, the book um, uh, came, to, came, to, came to life. So, yeah. Brilliant. Um, Yasmin. Um, how does it feel to be part of the book? And when did you know you were actually part of this book? Oh, wow. Um, well, I feel humbled, uh, to say the least. Uh, it's quite surreal to keep seeing my name 
pop up on 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 pages of an actual published and printed book. So so I am very honored really to be uh, a part of this wonderful project that belongs to someone that means so much to me. Um, and as some of you might already recognize by reading the book, you know, to those who have read it, uh, my friendship with Dr. Shahad is one that I hold very near and dear to my heart. Um, I found out I was going to be featured in the book. I believe it was back uh, in early 2020 or early the beginning of the pandemic around that time. And I was super excited about it. And I was just waiting for it to, to come to life. And, and I remember I kept snagging uh, Dr. Shahed, you know, when am I gonna read uh, bits and pieces of it? I want to, you know, I want an insight. I wanna know what you're writing. And, and she kept it a secret from me. I, I, haven't read a bo I haven't read the book or any bits and pieces of the book until she gave me an actual copy a couple of days ago. So um, it is quite surreal and I, I'm super excited about it. That's, uh, that's good to hear. Um, is there a particular passage that resonates with you um, in, that reflects perhaps your relationship with, uh, with Dr. Al Shamri? Um, actually, I like a specific passage. I, I, there are so many different lines and, 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 and passages throughout the entire book that, that really resonate with me. I don't think there is one specific one that comes to mind. Um, the part that we did read, though, is definitely one that that means a lot because it's it's a very honest and raw reflection of our friendship and and our bond um and all of it is really based off of our our real friendship and it's quite honest and it's quite vulnerable and i feel like the entire book uh is is just a, a really true reflection of that so a specific passage i i can't pin it down but definitely um, and just these little, um, you know, quirky conversations that go back and forth, the, the, the countless amount of questions that I'm always asking uh, Dr. Shahed, those are very uh, true to life. And, and um, I always used to think that she'd one day eventually get sick and tired of, of every single question that I have to ask her, you know, um, but I do look at her as, as a mentor, as someone who has all the answers. So, um, and I, I feel like that is beautifully reflected in, in the entire book. I would, I would absolutely agree with you. Um, so uh, Shahad, um, what do you enjoy the most about being an author, would you say? And are there any elements that were particularly challenging with, with this specific book? Um, I think we'll start with the challenging elements. Um, so one of the, um, I think, difficult uh, points in, in writing nonfiction is allowing that sense of vulnerability to come through. And uh, being an academic, uh, you know, incredibly um, respected at work, very different from being an author who is writing very, very vulnerably and openly. And I think trying to find that balance was incredibly difficult, uh, not just with Head Above Water, but also with earlier works. I would have students, you know, knocking on my door saying, you know, is this true? Did this really happen to you? Please tell me. I'd like to know. Um, so th there seemed to be no uh, disconnect between these two identities and uh, people always wanted to know more. And I think it was incredibly difficult to kind of still trying to figure out how to how to find that balance, because we're not just one kind of static identity. I'm different at home. I'm different with, you know, my publisher and then with my readers or with students. It's all of these different identities that have to come through. Um, so being an author, but also being an academic, uh, you know, immediately talking about something completely different, uh, you know, within the classroom and then having a student come up and say, hey, can you sign my copy? Um, it, it really, really has a sense of um, being unable to really figure out how this is the same person, that this is actually me. I'm in this boat right now. I'm wearing the, this hat right now and then I've taken it off. So I think it's a bit um, random for me, kind of like MS being sometimes an invisible disability and sometimes visible. I just have to find that kind of uh, balance. Um, I think the the fun part or the part that really, really, especially with Head Above Water has really changed my life is I've managed to not just have my friends as a circle and, and my students, but I've connected to a lot of book reviewers on Instagram. And, you know, they've started these conversations with me that are vulnerable too. You know, they've shared their own insights about, you know, their pain about disability. And I'm quite honored because I'm a stranger to them at the end of the day. 
but it's it's the book has bridged all of these different um, connections and allowed me to listen to others too rather than just me being the author, the speaker, people are now talking to me about uh, similar uh, themes and identities. And you know, the, 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 what the book has done for them is what they're giving me back. So I feel like it's a transaction that I'm really, really benefiting from right now. It, it um, really is mind blowing more than anything. Yeah, and it reminds me actually at uh, the London Muslim Festival where we had a stall and there was a young woman that I introduced you to who, yeah had recently been diagnosed. And so actually it was it was a blessing to be able to connect you both. Um, and I'm sure that there are a lot of other young people out there who are going through a lot of questions that you've already uh, gone through and faced. So, um, and so what are you talking about disabilities? What do you think are some of the major misconceptions and beliefs regarding disability that you find you're sort of debunking? So I think that's a really good question, Archana, because there's so many myths around that. So I teach a class and on, on fairy tales. And um, when you think about fairy tales, uh, all of the evil characters and fairy tales tend to have some sort of disability or some sort of scar, some sort of visible scar. So I think in our um, sort of like in, in our collective unconscious, we have this idea that disability is evil or to be feared. Disability is ugly, uh, not lovable. Um, not it's not a life worth living it's a punishment it's a tragic ending so again you think about all the characters you you have tons of them I won't go through them but you can always of course read read uh, and look into it so I feel like having to work against that is quite hard because not only am I working against that verbally but I'm also trying to change how people think also with their unconscious thoughts so for example a lot of people now have started saying things like, Dr. Shad, you're so inspiring. And while I'm really grateful for that really nice you know, intention, uh, to me, it doesn't, and to a lot of people with disabilities, it doesn't uh, feel uh, too, too good. It's basically saying that an author living with an illness or a disability is inspiring just because they managed somehow. But if I was writing another book and that book was about, say, love and my experience with love and loss, I don't think anyone will, will actually say, you know, Dr. Shed, that was inspiring. They might say that was a really moving depiction of love. So rather than tie that to, to the author. Um, so disability is either inspiring or as tragic, either as pitiful or inspiring. And I think what I hope Head Above Water can do is challenge that notion. So even as people read, I really hope they move away from how we usually think about disability as either, you know, all good or all evil. Um, there's, there's a whole spectrum, just like everything else in life. There's a whole spectrum of it. Uh, disability is not always visible either. So um, again, there's, you know, there's this myth that disability is what you see all the time, you know, using a wheelchair. Those are the people who need to use um, accessible uh, toilets or accessible parking spots. And it's something that I kind of live with daily, you know, having to say uh, or to prove that in fact, you know, I do need this accommodation, which in itself is really hard because um, when you don't believe someone, you've already put them in, in a position of, um, you know, trying to prove so it, it puts them in this position of you're a liar until proven otherwise so it's it's quite difficult really and um i can't do it all on my own that's where authors come in and that's where publishers come in and that's where readers come in and friends and colleagues and in general i really hope to see more um, depiction of disability that is um diverse to say the least and real rather than just you know this trope or this metaphor or this um this this idea that hopefully will teach other people to to you know love their abled bodied lives more it's not there to teach you a lesson to kind of think phew alhamdulillah i don't have to live with that i really don't want to see that and i, I see a lot of it still sometimes um you know, you see someone in a wheelchair, or someone who's struggling, and then you actually see people looking at at uh, at that person, at that individual, and you can see the gaze of pity, but also a relief, a sense of relief that that's not me. Alhamdulillah, mm. that's not me. Mm. 
So it's quite, uh, I think it's quite complicated. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done. And I hope Head of Water can start that conversation uh, for, for others too. That's a really interesting, interesting take uh, on that. Um, actually, it leads us to the next question. So how can able-bodied people be better allies to those with disabilities? I think that's um, the the big question. Um, it's it's in the same um, sense of saying you know men can be better allies to women to feminists. Same thing, able-bodied uh, people can be better allies. So you advocate uh, for um, disability in the publishing industry in in movies. Uh, when you write about disability, if you're a writer, you don't use disability as a metaphor. That's if you're in the writing field. Um, and if you have power, any sort of power, you make sure that buildings are accessible. Conferences, hold them virtually. It's okay, especially now after the pandemic, we're aware that this is a possibility. Um, don't uh, don't just forget um, um, that other people have different uh, and, and important needs to accommodate at conferences. Uh, there's also a lack of sign language in most conferences I've been to, um, no interpreters provided. So again, the power is there, the money is there, but there's a lack of uh, interest in being better allies. Um, of course, watching our language too. So learn the correct language, the correct language to use and correct others who use the inappropriate language. There are still people who use incredibly outdated language and people don't, don't bother to correct them. So I think those are just you know, a few ways that able-bodied people can be uh, better allies. That's terrific. Um, Yasmin, I'd like to turn to you again. Um, so how does this book cross the boundaries in the student professor relationship, do you think? Um, well, I remember taking several classes with, uh, with Dr. Shahad that included sitting around in a circle. Uh, and this sort of acted like uh, an intimate safe space where whatever you had to say was, it was almost sacred. Uh, it was taken into consideration. Uh, you were heard. This is mentioned in the book several times. Uh, the idea of feeling seen and heard is, is one Dr. Shahad feels strongly about, um, one that we all feel very strongly about, and one that gave us all center stage. Uh, this, this kind of allowed for a bridge to take place, I'd like to say, a bridge that uh, closes the gap between professor and student, between uh, the authority and the subordinates. Uh, naturally, everyone would, would feel welcomed at this point. Um, we were taught to speak our minds, and no one would ever judge you for what you had to say. Uh, we exchanged our worries, we exchanged our fears, our anxieties, we talked about our happiest moments, um, you know, the moments that changed our lives forever and, and the memories that we still carry with us. Uh, and we empowered each other through these conversations and, and this type of storytelling and um, uh, the, the environment that Dr. Shahid had kind of created for us is one that we are very fortunate to have. And uh, in my four years at the university, no other professor had ever done that for us. Um, we saw her as a, a leading female figure uh, in such a male dominated space. Um, she reminds us always that our voices matter and agency is something we should use very carefully uh, as a tool of resistance. And I think all of this is, is you know, beautifully emphasized in, in the book and, and um, being able to have that space where you can talk freely and openly about anything and, and not feel like um, uh, you're gonna be, uh, uh, you know, judged or discriminated against is, is super important. And um, that is one of the things that I feel like definitely um, brought us closer, uh, created these beautiful bonds and these beautiful connections with one another. And everyone felt super you know, comfortable in their own skin and whatever they had to say was fully accepted, fully taken in. They were, like I said, seen and heard. And um, I, I, I truly thought that um, all of these conversations that were going on about the, having a, cir a circle, constantly reminding us of the circle and, and having people that have your back. So knowing whenever we would walk into any of Dr. Shahad's classes, uh, even though in the beginning of the semester, these students and these people might seem like they're strangers, you don't quite know them. By the end of the semester, you know, we all know each other's secrets, our, our vulnerabilities, and, and um, you know, talking about that in the book, I feel like 
um, definitely sheds light on on something that uh, is quite often, you know, um, not really looked at. Um, being able to have that space where you feel safe and comfortable to talk, and 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 your agency being at the forefront, is is super super important. So definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and and I guess the issue is that we we have vulnerabilities that again, as uh, Shahada said, may not be visible. And so if you right. have that very warm and welcoming thing, you can actually offload uh, in a way and become relieved, you know, after an academic session, which I think is it's it's that's beautiful. Um, so Yasmin, um, we understand that some of your students have signed up for this event. Um, do you see parallels in the way that you're teaching compared to how Dr. Shahad taught you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I constantly say this to myself and I, and I say this to my closest friends. Um, I am the teacher that I am today because of Dr. Shahid. Um, and, and I know that she wasn't actively teaching me how to be a teacher, but through all the life lessons that I've, I've gained from, you know, having these conversations with her, being in her class, um, definitely shaped who I am today. Um, and one of the main things that I definitely do try to bring to the table is, is creating those safe spaces for my students. I try as much as possible to allow my, uh, allow my students to uh, express in whichever way they would like, to talk about whatever they would like with no judgment. Um, it was, uh, uh, you know, a place, or I try to create this place where everyone is welcome. Um, I recognize that also, you know, some girls are too shy to answer out loud, and I never let that be the determining factor to how smart they are. And that's something Dr. Shad also always reminds us of, you know, just because you're shy, just because you're quiet doesn't mean you're not smart, doesn't mean you're not really digesting everything in. And 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 often it's it's the quiet students that excel in, in my classes. Um, so having the students or allowing them to speak their minds um, and, and having, having them back up their opinions with reason is definitely something that I also encourage. Um, providing validation, uh, generating connections that are more like friendships, uh, I, I genuinely think brings a sense of safety, you know, of softness. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so Shahad, um, why you, you, storytelling is a really integral part of this book. Um, so uh, why do you believe that storytelling is a powerful survival tool? And can you bring up, you know, notions of memory? Because so as we all I, know, certainly from a scientific basis, our memories are always changing. Absolutely. So I think with uh, storytelling, and, you know, I always say this and believe this, we really do tell stories all the time. So um, I got up today, I had a cup of coffee. Uh, it was a difficult day. I'm, I'm narrating already. I'm already in the process of narration. So we experience things and then we narrate them. How we narrate them is the storytelling part. And of course, uh, once we start narrating, then we were already um, constructing or, or fashioning a memory, even if that memory is going to be long gone later, or you might not actually recall it as it happened, you've narrated the experience. And at least for me, narrating an experience kind of gives me a sense of control over the actual, um, the fact that the experience itself can slip away from me and that I might not be able to recall it as it happened. So I think with MS and with a lot of also with age and with a lot of other, of course, illnesses, there is this uh, idea that you will not remember, you know, who you are, where you come from, what has happened to you. Is this the body that I, I that I remember? Is this the person that I remember? But also in general, when we tell a story, even with able-bodied individuals telling a story, it's not necessarily the story that you think happened. Your perception plays a huge role in it. So just you know, think about how you remember your childhood days. You might remember your brother uh, stealing something from you, but in fact, it, it wasn't that. That wasn't the way it was fashioned. So I think storytelling, I kind of want to connect back to Yasmin, is a big part of agency and a big part of voice. And with marginalized groups or um, groups that are often not heard, um, with, with people with illnesses, for example, they don't get to tell their story. There's a lot of people speaking for them, medical doctors. Um, it's just a file and you know, patient, blah, 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 number, blah, 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 entry to the hospital on this day diagnosed with, discharged with, conclusion, end of, end of story. So not having that ability to speak 
is I think what gets what gets taken away from people with illnesses and disabilities and women, for example, are not heard most of the time. So having that sense of storytelling is having that sense of voice and agency and really, really um, asking um, to be heard or demanding to be heard. And I think for me, storytelling is a privilege. And like all privileges, I don't want to ignore it or to just, uh, you know, abuse it in a, in a sense. I believe because I have that voice or now I have that voice, that voice as an author, as an academic, as someone who's an educator, I'd like to be able to use that voice to lend it to others who also would otherwise not be able to have their stories heard. Um, not speak for them, but speak with them and um, actually use this privilege to be heard. So, you know, I, I hope that that's what I can do for storytelling. Um, I also urge people always to document their memories and to write, um, you know, what happens on a daily basis, whether blogging was a big thing, I think about a decade ago, not so much anymore with, with Twitter and Instagram. But I think those stories are really, really what we uh, hold on to, 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 you know, to survive and they keep us pretty much rooted, even when you feel disconnected from your body, or you feel disconnected from your environment. Um, it's, it's that storytelling that keeps us going. For me, I think because I love literature, it's it's that heartbeat that I have, and I'm, you know, I hope I continue to have it. Fantastic. Um, I was going to ask you another question, but I think I will leave this because we have a whole bunch of questions. I think um, the team is going to field to you, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lisa and Jade, who I believe are going to be uh, looking through the questions and posing them to uh, to us. Yeah, sure. So I'll start with the first question, which is from Istra. Uh, so after jumping into three different genres, poetry, short stories, and nonfiction, which genre would you like to explore next? This is a question for Shahed. Um, I think it's not for me. I think I found my voice in narrative nonfiction. So maybe essays in the future, but definitely I think that's my genre. I love all the genres, but I think this one has a lot of power. From what I'm able to, to see, I think there's a lot of power in nonfiction. And a lot of people think nonfiction is um, boring or scientific or you know something that is just meant to teach you something. But I think there's a lot of emotion in narrative nonfiction, and I hope to explore that. And I think actually that answers Sophia's question as well. So I might just skip to the next one. So there's one from Maya who asks, do you think you were rejected from publishers because your story wasn't seen as appealing to the white gaze? I, I mean, you'll never really know because it's a bunch of answers, you know, I, something that I'd like to know. Uh, but I think because the book does not really deal specifically with Islamic culture and, you know, I'm Muslim, so that's a big part of, you know, who I am, but that's not there in the book. You don't really find that in, in the book. And a lot of the books that get picked up usually have something to say about Islam, whether um, against Islam or pro-Islam, there has to be that, that element there. Uh, I don't think it is appealing to, to the white gaze. And uh, I think not just that, but maybe also the disability um, angle. I think that was a question for Archana, maybe. The yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd like to step in here. I don't think that it's on. I don't think that was the issue. I think that there are, you know, geography, I think probably came into it. A notion of what's specific and what's universal came into it. Um, so I, I, and obviously, as we know, uh, Shahad, you know, we, we can't talk about it, but we have interest from the US. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of readers uh, on this group who are white. So I think that um, it, it's a lot of things that go into a decision whether to publish or not. Um, and, and, you know, I would emphasize that to me, I read it, and obviously I'm not white, but, you know, I read it as a universal uh, story. I, I, I really did. And I think that there'll be ample people from all walks of life, disabled, abled, um, religious, non-religious, uh, you know, white, brown, black, etc., who will connect with this book. So. And I've just seen a question for Yasmin, actually, um, which is, would you be interested in publishing something in the future? If so, what would that be? Uh, I would definitely love to publish in the future. Um, I actually do write a bit of poetry. Um, fiction is definitely something I would also like to dip my toes in. Uh, so uh, it is it is a dream. 
hopefully one day it will come true. Yes. You have a publisher, yes, <laughs> Wonderful. Good to know. <laughs> um, Shahad, I have a question on here from Isra. She says, what books about disability would you recommend to everybody to read? Hmm, that's, a, that's a good question, Isra. Isra is actually one of my students. She always asks the difficult questions. <laughs> um, I think the um, I think Disfigured, the Amanda uh, Lidic book, is really one to start with. I really like that one. It's very accessible. Uh, I'll just type that into the chat. It might be a bit helpful. I'll think of a better list soon, Isra, I promise. And um, Sharika from the Netherlands has asked a couple of questions. Um, she says, do you feel like your disability was a blessing towards you finding your freedom and your voice? Um, no, I think maybe uh, literature was that blessing and connection and friendship. I think that was the, the, the way I, I've managed to find my voice. I think if um, I didn't have stories and storytelling, then there would be no blessing. Um, sorry. Uh, she also wrote, uh, you've written about women in your social circle and they were and are stuck inside the cultural box and how they suffer. As someone who has gone beyond that box, do you ever feel a sort of survivor's guilt? And if so, how do you ever deal with it? Hmm, so an interesting question. Um, one I actually haven't thought about. Um, I think with at least uh, I'll speak about a uh, disability I'll speak about MS because that's a more one I can relate to um survival's guilt maybe with MS um because I belong to a few groups where um well MS hits people very very differently and so sometimes people really really um have different and difficult experiences I'm still uh, working I'm still able to teach with you know my own set of struggles, but I do sometimes feel survival's guilt for actually you know still being able to teach, and I hope that answers that. Yeah, um, there's a question on here from HK. Um, I think she's one of your students. Um, he, they've written, considering I was lucky enough to be part of Dr. Shahab's writing classes and got to know the process of writing, but what actually got you to be able to think something is publishable from your work when you first started and what were some things that stood in your way? Mm, uh, I think so I belonged to a few writing groups and writing communities when I was younger um, there was an actual writing community where we shared our work together and I think having that sense of feedback and that writing community uh, led me to believe there might be something there but I would say also there was a lot of um, support or academic support from people who believed that these stories needed to be publishable so not just the writing style itself but also the content the story itself uh, so I think that's where I ended up thinking okay then there must be something there I also blogged for about a decade and I had a lot of readers and people who were, you know, giving feedback. And then I realized that maybe there is something that could be publishable beyond the blog. Uh, what were the first things that stood in my way? Um, definitely the same thing we talked about. No access to publishing houses. Uh, no, no access to them even locally. Locally, you need to write in Arabic if you want to publish, if you live in, in, in our part of the world. So it's you know, even using English as as uh, the you know medium is is problematic. So, yeah. We have a question from Sarah for Shahed as well. Um, which parts of the book were particularly difficult to write, and why? Hmm. Well, I think a lot of it uh, was difficult because a lot of it is revisiting. Um, you know, memories that um, were difficult to recollect. And I had to rely on diary entries, uh, blog posts. I've looked back at, you know, decades worth of, of documents basically. And um, a lot of it was also revisiting trauma. And when you're writing as a writer and you're revisiting trauma, you need to have some sort of distance from it. So you write and then you step away from, from the book. 
you write and then you you know talk to a therapist you write and you do some meditation a lot of it was actually almost like reopening that wound or like we um re-accessing that place that you didn't necessarily want to access so i think for me it was hard labor it, it really was and you know many times i really did just want to stop um but you know i had a lot of people who said actually this might there might be something there um a a, a writer herself uh, one of my friends uh, fedwa will actually read a few pages and said you know this is brilliant i've never seen anything like it in arabic i've never seen it she, she writes in arabic and she's an arabic novelist and she said that's something although it's quite traumatic it's quite healing for the reader to read it's like a gift that you've given us so that's when i realized that although it was difficult to write and probably even re-experiencing some traumatic memories that there will be some sense of healing for others, not just me. Um, actually, uh, re relating on that, um, I don't know if we have more questions, but um, so what advice would you have for aspiring writers um, or even readers of Head Above Water? Um, well, I think for the readers of Head Above Water, I really hope that you take the book as, 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 as I said, as, as a gift, um, because a big part of writing these, these sort of stories that are really, you know, honest and vulnerable is that you want a reader that actually listens. So instead of being carried away with, you know, inspirational mottos and stories or being carried away with a sense of, um, I actually want to analyze, you know, what parts are true, what parts aren't. I hope you take it as a gift and, you know, provide that ear that, you know, lend me that ear in the way that Yasmin does in, in, in the narrative. So she, you know, lends us her ear and she's willing to listen and, and uh, believe. So she starts with, with believing the narrative. And I think that's an honor, that's a privilege. And I, I hope that readers will, will do the same. Uh, for writers, I hope it's also, you know, gives you this sense of writing nonfiction or narrative nonfiction, um, you know, saying it as it is, uh, maybe it starts a trend of narrative nonfiction writing from this part of the world, I hope. Are there more questions or can I ask Shahada? I think we'll do, maybe we'll do one more question okay. from the audience. Does that sound good? Um, so we've got one from Raya who asks, um, was there a limit to how truthful you can be in the book due to the fact that you as a university lecturer might need to keep some things at bay? I think so, Raya, yes. And I think a big part of it was also, um, you know, pr protecting the integrity of a lot of these characters and these uh, people who actually show up in the story. Uh, so, of course, there are things that are left out and better left unsaid. Um, and there are a lot of characters that are composite, uh, composite characters. They're a blend of different characters. And I think, you know, being aware of that is also a big part of the ethics of life writing in general. So, yeah, I, I hope that, you know, the next book is, is if, if there is a next book, that there is the sense of exploring um, a bit more uh, with that. Um, so the question that I wanted to close with is, do you have a, a, um, a writing routine? So do you end up, um, you know, writing at a particular time of day or how did you, how did you compile this book basically? So um, when the pandemic hit, I had a lot of time that I otherwise would not have had as, as, a, as an academic who's working full time. Uh, so I was able to work with the limited energy that I have and actually put that into the writing rather than teaching. And I think uh, that that was kind of um, something that changed for me, having limited energy, but also being able to work from home. Again, accessibility, something that I don't usually have the privilege of. Um, I don't believe in writer's block. And I say this to a lot of students. I actually uh, believe writing is a process of discipline rather than just creativity. Uh, so I do make sure that if I'm going to write, then I'm going to write on that day. Um, you know, I might put it off for like half an hour, but I will write on that day. And I think that might be the educator in me, you know, making sure that I meet deadlines. Yeah, that's uh, that's great advice to all writers. Just write every day, a little bit every day. Um, you know, this has been a really, uh, I've certainly really enjoyed the evening. I hope that everyone who uh, has participated and who's been listening has enjoyed it. Um, I just want to thank uh, Shahad very much and thank Yasmin very much. 
uh, and also thank my team because they're awesome <laughs> and they've made this all uh, you know happen and um and actually the other practical thing is if you do have questions that are that are still remaining or you haven't asked um shahad or or yasmin or ourselves please connect with us on social media or uh, email to us and then um i'm sure that one of us will will um will answer answer your question so thank you very much for your participation um and uh, please go ahead and buy the book and read it. Um, you won't yeah. regret it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Archana. Thank you, everyone.